Right, let's continue the conversation around the scourge of rape in our country. Political leaders speaking out at the weekend condemning uh, this incident. The EFF, for example, suggesting a special rape police unit saying offenders should be removed from society. The ANC's uh, Social Transformation Subcommittee suggesting that uh, the government should implement chemical castration for offenders. Joining me now for this discussion, I'm joined uh, by Bafana Kumalo. He is from the Songke Gender Justice. He joins us online. We also joined in studio by Mandisa Kanyele. She is from the Rise Up Against Gender-Based Violence. We also are joined by Zolanem Kiva. He is a leader within Contralesa. That's a, a traditional uh, leadership uh, organization. To all of you, thank you very much for making the time. I'm going to start in studio uh, with you, Mandisa. When you first heard of this incident, what came to mind? Uh, strangely enough, I was at uh, a strategic planning session for the upcoming uh, Second Ever Gender Summit. I don't know if you remember, today's the 1st of August, and uh, it's four it years to month? the day. Not just marks women's month, but four years today since the 2018 uh, total shutdown march, where women around the country uh, said no means no, and they do not want to live in a country where they are not free from violence. Our constitutional rights uh, are not being respected. And to have this happen now, during this time, is just a reflection of the, of the true picture of what violence still looks like in our society. It's a reflection of the fact that, yes, there have been strides made at a policy level, at a legislative level. Um, there's movement that has happened between now and then. But at the same time, the stats are frighteningly not changing. Yeah. The, like, especially sexual offenses. We, we average nothing less than 45,000 sexual offenses per annum. Yeah. Our entire prison population is less than 200,000 people. If every single one of those people were jailed, we wouldn't have enough prisons to put them in. What are we doing? All right. L let me bring in the other guests. Mr. Mkiva, uh, let me come to you. I know that uh, you already have expressed a view <coughs> around some of the proposals in how to deal with the scourge of rape in our country. But before we get into that, when you heard of this gruesome incident, men taking turns on young women. Some of them we read in newspapers saying that these people stole our virginity. What came to mind? Well, it's really disturbing <clears throat> beyond words. Uh, we are actually taken aback and disgusted as the Congress of Traditional Leaders of South Africa that in this day and age that we would have people who behave in that manner. And I think we agree with the view that people like that ought to be taken and removed from society. They can't live amongst the people with that kind of conduct. It's really shocking, and we add our voice in condemning this. And we think that it is not going to take only the law enforcement agencies to do away with crime in our country. I think we as the citizens, uh, this is the time where we have to join hands and ensure that we are united mm. in fighting against this kind of practices. Rapists, murderers, racists, they are making our country volatile. And I think there is a proliferation of crime and we have become headquarters of criminality of all kinds in South Africa. And it's time for us to rise and stand against this. Otherwise, our future is bleak. Mr. Kumalo, your thoughts on what happened on Friday, or at least as this incident started coming to light, because the understanding is that it possibly would have occurred on Thursday, and only Friday did the whole of South Africa get to know of this gruesome act. Uh, your thoughts about what the scourge of rape in our country is doing to women? Thank you, Koli. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I was filled with a lot of anger. Um, angry because as the members of the community were indicating, they have been reporting these incidences since February this year. Mm. And the bigger question that was in my mind was where is crime intelligence in this country? How is it possible that the community can be uh, under siege, you know, by marauding gangs of men who simply are a law unto themselves? And 
this care could have been prevented mm. you know and the problem in this country is that we wait for an episode like this to amass resources to deal with something that we could have you know moved in swiftly quickly and avoided this incident and so i'm i'm quite shocked that you know the police um were told about this and did nothing local government was told that the grass is too long there's no lighting only the last week the mayor was reporting we are considering putting up lights in that in that community now you know this is unfair uh, uh, only that women always have to be you know facing these kinds of calamities for the state to move and do something about this yeah. it really is an indictment against our government that we continue to put lives of women and girls in such situations it's not acceptable yeah and you raise crucial points there where is crime intelligence police we're told about this this morning the police minister telling the earlier show before this one that their view is that this is possibly an organized or a premeditated act and so you raise quite a crucial question where is crime intelligence yes it's good for him to come and pontificate on national television about this could have been organized but what is he doing where's crime intelligence we're going to continue the conversation in a moment let's take a break when we return those key questions around proposals around what police should be doing we tackle all of that watching news feed i am and uh, if you're just joining us uh, we are discussing the rape incident that occurred at the weekend a very gruesome incident eight women gang raped and men taking turns yeah it's difficult to even think about it and with me for this discussion in studio i have mandisa kanyile she is from the rise up against gender based violence i've got bafana kumalo who is from the sonke gender justice he joins us virtually i've also got mr zolanim kiva who is from the organization contralesa let me come back in studio mandisa you have heard the proposals coming at the weekend particularly from political parties the eff suggesting that there should be a special unit within the police that's whose attention is focused on uh, rape the ANC coming out of its policy conference saying that chemical castration is possibly the solution to this your thoughts it's hilarious that an organization that was involved in uh, making our constitution would think that that would pass through in court but okay um, let's talk about realistic uh, so, it's a, uh, <laughs> so it's actually a joke is it? it for me I think it is because firstly in countries where they have implemented it we're not actually seeing a direct correlation for, to it being a deterrent it's similar to the death penalty it's a, it's a non conversation mm. but what I do think they should be doing is service delivery to areas where there's issues for example if there's bad lighting fix it so that people are safer create the safe cities campaign is only working in the KZN region at the moment what is supposed to happen to the rest of the country if you continue to allow spaces that make it easy for perpetrators to do violent acts and you know about it then you cannot be trying to make it to, to catch it at the end where we're talking about sentencing but the crime has already happened yeah. what are you doing around prevention it is one of the one of the six key pillars of the national strategic plan against gender-based violence and femicide you committed to this in 2018 you committed to it again in 2019 you committed again in 2020 you're very good at committing and making rash statements but what are you doing truly around prevention resourcing organizations that are supposed to be doing behavioral change programs on the ground all of these things that are required and that you know the steps are there but they're not doing implementation they are not resourcing implementation yep and implementation has been uh, almost uh, the rallying point even from within the ranks of the ANC itself mr. Mkiva let me come to you you have voiced your concerns around the proposal of chemical castration just give us your position around this specific proposal now first of all let me say that the, the women within the ANC are the ones who proposed uh, the chemical castration and I think for me what I'm getting from that is a cry <clears throat> for help from women and uh, in a state of affairs of this magnitude <clears throat> people will come with all sorts of proposals 
But what is important is to apply ourselves properly. Mm. So as Contralesa, we, we are not wanting to be seen to be condemning a proposal, but rather to make a contribution to say what is the best mechanism. And I think I agree with Mandisa that one of the things that we ought to do is prevention. As, and, and as they say, prevention is better than cure. The truth of the matter is that Singenelo Yinja Endli Abim Zanzafri. Now, we don't believe that chemical castration will be helpful. Actually, it may have unintended consequences. Such as? Because in, in itself, it can be a solution because you may be producing or reproducing monsters to society. The best thing to do is to remove rapists from society. But as I, as I say, I am in full agreement that uh, we ought <clears throat> to work on prevention. And prevention is the best mechanism of uh, fighting crime. And that is why I said from the onset that if we put hands together, if at the, at, at, at the, the amount of crime that we have in the country actually needs both the army and police to put their hands on the deck. Yeah. There are a lot of arms <clears throat> which are in circulation in our country which are used in these um, cr criminal you know, activities. So I think time has come for the law enforcement agencies to really take up this issue and ensure that we prevent many things from happening. Because there's a lot quickly, that is happening. People are murdered on a daily basis as yeah. well. Yeah. Let me quickly come in there. You, you talk about the security situation. I want to reserve that for Mr. Kumalo, who raised it a little earlier. A representative mm. of Contralesa at the weekend was mm. overheard on radio suggesting that chemical castration being proposed would be tantamount to taking away people's manhood. Is that even a comment that we can start talking about? Why should we consider that person's manhood when they have the capability to do what they so wish on a body of a woman? No, I don't think that argument <laughs> would really uh, uh, be valid. Uh, I, I, I think it must have been taken out of context. I think the issue is that sometimes a wrong person may be wrongly sentenced uh, for a crime that he didn't do. And as a result, that person may fall victim of the very chemical castration. But as I say, I don't think at this stage... Uh, that argument should be put forward. It, it is not a valid argument that... Uh, so it was wrong for your representative to even suggest such? No, as I say, I think he was understood in, 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 in out of context. All right. That's not, if, okay. you, if you listen to the totality of the interview, that is not what he is saying. Okay. Mr. Kumalo, let's come back to you. You've raised the issue of uh, crime intelligence. What is it that police are, are doing or not doing. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to squeeze your response. But first, let's throw to the police minister because I don't want to be the one who is uh, quoting him here. He's going to say, I misquoted him. Here he is telling our colleague, Michelle Craig, a little earlier about what they think is this crime is all about. Let's just take a listen. We discover as we go forward that it doesn't look like it was an innocent uh, if anything like that exists. Uh, rape, where we, th there are few things that we don't understand that needs a thorough investigation, uh, which we hope it might not have been si something that was organized and staged uh, to be that way. But uh, it would be enough to say so at the present moment. But the uh, more you hear, more you get disturbed, uh, uh, Michelle, mm -hmm. about what happened there. So, so Minister, you're saying it, it, it looks like it was an organized attack, a premeditated attack, at least from the, the information that you have so far? Yes, it, it, it does. It does look that, it does look that way. Uh, I, I, the, for instance, there were 12 women there. Uh, six women, eight women were raped and four women were not raped. And uh, you, you try to find out uh, how that happened uh, up to this point. It doesn't give a proper answer, um, Chad. And unfortunately, uh, the, the women that were, were raped, uh, eight, uh, almost eight of them, seven were, were, were African young women, very young, some of them. And uh, the group of women that were not raped there, it happened to be the other demographs of South Africa, 
that survive that, that thing. But uh, the, the, there is something that keeps coming, that uh, the police are going beyond the rape that happened there as they are investigating something that could have been staged, as we say. All right. Uh, Mr. Kumano, I know you are going to be the one responding directly to the minister, but I need to take a break. So let's do exactly that. We're going to come back and wrap this conversation up. This is News Feed, the AM edition. You're watching News Feed AM, and uh, we are wrapping up a discussion around the scourge of rape in our country. This in the wake of eight women being gang raped uh, in the area of Kruger Storp. Mr. Kumalo, uh, the police minister suggesting that this could have been an organized attack against these women. Uh, do you agree with his at least preliminary assessment of the issue? Because I, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination, he is concluding that this is the case, but he suggests that there are things that point to somehow this being a premeditated crime. Well, Oli, I, I first want to weigh in and support what my colleagues have said about what is being proposed um, at the ANC conference. Uh, but the minister's comment as well, I, I just want to say, I sometimes wish politicians would really take time to think through what they want to say before they really make statements that may be misconstrued uh, in the public space. I, I don't see, as Mandisa says, how castration would resolve the issue of rape. We know that what that actually tends to do is that men become more brutal. They use brooms, they use bottles, they use all sorts of uh, machinations. Rape is not about sex. Rape is about power, about how men think they can subdue women. So some of these solutions, which are not well thought through, are very, very problematic because they are not very helpful mm. in taking us forward. With regards to the minister, I would have wished that he would have allowed himself and his police to really do the investigation in the background, and then when they come to the public, they come with a fuller story. Yeah. To make such conjectures now in the public without being fully informed as to what is happening, I think is really mischievous. Um, I would have preferred that, you know, they do their investigation so that when they do come public, they come with a fuller story and explain to the nation what actually happened. Yeah. Because now what this does is fuel speculations and theories and does not help us really deal with what uh, happened in Kruger's door. It does not answer the question why the police did not respond since February before this incident. It does not answer the question why the local government did not take responsibility for ensuring that the grass is cut, that light is provided, that those groups that everybody knew are operating in that area are being dealt with. Yeah. So there's a lot that I think, you know, authorities need to answer for. All right. Let's... Get final thoughts. Mandisa, I've got so many questions for you, but unfortunately I can only squeeze in one because of time. Uh, you mentioned something about KZN getting it right. I wonder uh, what you're based that on. But the question I'd like for us to not miss in this discussion oh. is that in police holding cells at the moment, we have 80 people, and in what at least law enforcement has been telling us is that all of them appear to be illegal migrants. Is there something to be said about the scourge of crime that is allegedly being perpetrated by foreign nationals in our country? What I'm going to talk about is possible solutions. I, I do not think that we should uh, put the crime burden on illegal uh, migrants, I, 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 that conversation is, I think is, is a really long one and, and speaks to different issues. If we had mandatory DNA testing of the entire South African populace and everyone who enters our borders, we would be able to actually manage crime. Right now, we have rape kids sitting, but we have no one to identify or, 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 or you know what I mean? We don't have, we don't have samples to, to compare them against. If we had that kind of crime intelligence, we'd be able to solve crimes better. We'd be able to, even the undocumented persons, would be able, when they are incarcerated, like right now in the holding cell, we'd be able to utilize that time to actually get the kind of data that we need. But to just, 
to, to, to place the issue around our poorest borders and, and to kind of make it as though South African citizens are these wonderful individuals who don't <laughs> uh, perpetuate criminal acts isn't true. But at the same time, there needs to be something done around documenting people who are undocumented, right. finding alternative methods so that they can be found when they do commit crimes. Final thoughts, Mr. Mkiva, you lead an organization of traditional leaders. What is it that you can do, particularly, I think, in rural communities, to do away with the scourge of rape? Well, we have been calling for the institution of traditional leadership in the country to be empowered in terms of law to be able to work on crime prevention, prevention in our areas. Many of those powers have been taken away. And we believe that what now is happening in the cities and peri-urban areas is also permeating into rural communities. The sort of crimes that we see in urban spaces are equally seen in the rural spaces. And we believe that the traditional police that used to be there must be given back, and those powers should be given back to the traditional authority so that we can be able to deal with this. And I don't want uh, to overlook the issue of the presence of undocumented um, uh, uh, foreigners in our country. That also adds a lot into the crime. When people are undocumented, they are surely going to act in a manner that does not care because, after all, they are not under any identification and under any radar in these circumstances. So it does add a lot of uh, criminality in our communities, including drugs, which we now we see in our communities out there, even in rural areas. Children are selling drugs being sent by some of the foreign people in schools. So it's a money issue for them, and, uh, and, and therefore that translates to more criminality. So I'm saying that you empower traditional authority, we will be able at least to arrest crime in our spaces. All right. Mr. Kumalo, your thoughts, you were very much part of that famous gender-based violence march that... Mandisa so eloquently spoke about earlier in the show, but in the same breath, she says, post that march to the JSC, JSE, the stats are frightening. So what is to be done? Well, um, as Mandisa would know, um, government is very quick to make pronouncements, as she has uh, alluded, and, and to pontificate in the public space, but the action that needs to follow uh, those pronouncements is sadly lacking. One of our concerns as Soccer Gender Justice, as there's this planning for the next summit, is what will be different, really? Uh, we are going to the second summit to review what should have happened. There's still not commitment from government in terms of ensuring that resources are put into place for the implementation of that strategy. We still don't have a coordinating mechanism as is indicated by the strategy. And so we, we are worried that the summit should not yet be another talk shop where government just comes to give speeches and look good to the country because it seems like something is being done. Lives of women and girls are being compromised every day as we continue to pontificate in speeches. I think we've had more of that. What we need now is to get a clearer indication from government to say, here is a clear coordinating mechanism agreed with civil society. Here are resources that we are putting into the response to gender-based violence. When we had COVID, money was allowed to flow in dealing with COVID, which was a correct decision. Sure. And we have a huge issue of violence against women in this country, which is rampant, and yet the zero cent from government in implementing of that strategy. That is really a serious, serious problem for me. So I do think and hope that at least at this summit, we will not be hearing more speeches. We would rather be hearing more commitments in terms of what government is putting into action, its commitments, so that we can indeed see the turn of the tide against gender-based violence in this country. Bafana Kumalo from Sonke Gender Justice. Let me thank you very much for your time. Uh, Mandy Sakanyele in studio here with me. Rise up against uh, gender-based violence. Thank you very much for your uh, inputs here. And uh, Zoranem Kiva from Contralesa. Thank you, sir, for your time.